Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Berger. I'm the CEO of University Hospital of Brooklyn Downstate. I want to welcome everyone to the first in our new seminar series uh, ar around digital health. We have started a digital health interest group, and I, I think Dr. Kajnowski will talk a little bit about why digital health is so important, but I believe digital health is going to transform the way we deliver healthcare over the next few years. And <clears throat> even during the COVID pandemic, you've seen how telehealth has really come to the fore and has revolutionized how we care for our patients with COVID during this pandemic. Uh, as we kick off this digital health interest group, if you are interested in joining the group, please send me an email and it's david.berger at downstate.edu. That's david.berger at downstate.edu. And we'll be having a monthly seminar series and we'll be also developing other programming around digital health. I'm gonna kick it over to uh, Dr. Lazar who was kind enough to arrange this evening's speaker to introduce our speaker. Uh, thank you, Dr. Berger. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Stan Ketchnowski, who is the director of the Digital Health Program at Columbia's Business School and the chair of HITLAB, Health Information Technology Laboratory an organization that he himself founded some 20 years ago that routinely conducts digital health research, teaching and advisory services, services focusing on digital technology to improve healthcare delivery around the world. Dr. Kachnowski earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Vermont and went on to obtain a master's degree in public administration at the same institution. He subsequently earned his PhD at the University of Oxford. I must say, I first met Stan some 20 years ago when he was my professor. I was taking a, a master's of public health course at Columbia, and he taught a course that was named Healthcare E-Commerce. I sometimes wonder whether there's a digital fountain of youth, as it's remarkable that he doesn't appear to have aged a day, whereas I've gotten very gray myself. At that time, digital health was in its infancy and paper charting was really the only form of documentation. Little did I realize the visionary that Stan was at the time and how he would come to lead a think tank of renowned, sci of renowned scientists, data analysts, innovators, entrepreneurs, executives um, in the implementation, adaptation and diffusion of healthcare technologies. These include EMRs, wearables, big data, not only here in the United States, but globally as well. His symposia and competitions attract international healthcare executives and business leaders and visionaries. And Stan is a visiting professor at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. Over the past two decades, I've personally had the pleasure of collaborating with Stan and his team on a variety of digital health projects and have not only participated in various discussions, but have been enlightened by a person who has purpose, drive, and vision. I recall his recent inspiring closing comments about the pandemics literally sparking a digital revolution. Stan has worked tirelessly to improve healthcare and I'm grateful and proud to call him both a colleague and a friend. Stan. Well, again, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Lazar. Uh, humbled by the introduction and uh, I'm very, very honored to be speaking to uh, the, uh, the tremendous audience here today <clears throat> at Downstate <clears throat> and really do want to, to thank you, uh, Dr. Berger, and, and again, you, Dr. Lazar, uh, definitely the, uh, the all-star team here at Downstate and uh, Dr. Lazar, one of Columbia School of Public Health's all-time uh, digital health superstars for not just being a leader back then, but uh, taking it forward today as well. So thank you for the honor to present today. So uh, I think the, um, the idea here today is to really create a, an atmosphere of interactive discussion 
and learning. And while I am going to be uh, going through in some detail around the definition of digital health and talking about its, its origins uh, and certainly uh, its insights around the this unprecedented adoption of digital over the last uh, 20 months now, uh, I, I do want to make this interactive. So please do, uh, we already have one person raising their hand. Please do feel free to use the, the chat box. Uh, looks like we've already got some Dr. Berga doing that as well. And uh, would love to have this become interactive, but really from the standpoint of the presentation today, the, the three key learning objectives are, first of all, to make sure everyone here is gonna be familiar with the definition of digital health. There are a lot of definitions. And certainly we want to make sure that you all take away a key definition uh, here as well. Uh, secondly, we want to, uh, there are uh, insights delivered to you all about how digital health is emerging today as a technology in its unprecedented pace of diffusion in the ecosystem. And then thirdly, and lastly, uh, some guidance on how to apply these terms, these technologies, these techniques uh, into the ecosystem and into what you're doing today. Uh, and again, it looks like we already have one question from Mohammed. Mohammed, did you wanna ask your question now if you wanna use the chat box? or the Q&A section, feel free to do that as well. But um, again, we're a small enough group here today where um, you know, I would love to have this be as interactive as possible uh, to make sure that we're making this a, a very learning oriented session. Um, so around that, uh, this idea of digital health and what it brings together, first of all, the, the important notion here is that one component of digital health is around bioinformatics and the capture, storage, retrieval, and analysis and visualization, these five different points on the value chain of bioinformatics. And that is of all the data from the human body, your saliva, your hair, your tissue, your blood, anything from the human body that can be turned into data, turned into binary, that's the definition of bioinformatics. And that's the beginning of the definition of digital health. Uh, and again, any questions around that, happy to answer those. And, and bioinformatics, much less, much like rather the other side of digital health, which is biomedical informatics, is the, uh, the study of data around the human. So that could be electronic health records. It could be your wearables. It could be your voice skills. It could be your websites. Anything like that would be something in the biomedical informatics realm. And certainly today, as was referenced earlier, things like telemedicine, remote patient monitoring, uh, all of those are biomedical informatics. All of your analytics tools for then investigational work around the data and interrogating the data, that would be biomedical informatics. And so these tools are massive today. They've grown at an unprecedented rate from generally single digit, low single digit usage to uh, mid to high double digit usage with the exception of electronic health records, which we're already seeing a pretty massive diffusion rate in the ecosystem because of a substantial amount of economic incentives to use them. And so the second half of really of digital health care is this term in this field, it's been around for about 60 to 70 years called biomedical informatics. And so digital health and these fields. So you have the, all the data from the human body, all the data around the human body, creating these new tools to manage not only the digital human, but now to manage digital populations and being able to manage entire nations, entire uh, populations, uh, subpopulations within uh, cities and counties and states and obviously nations. Uh, to do so. And these things include things like persuasive, pervasive technologies. Uh, BJ Fogg from Stanford uh, University wrote a book called Persuasive Technology in 2003. Uh, again, a, a, about how to use technologies to help change human behavior as physicians. Uh, everyone's trying to understand how to change and how to optimize human behavior so that 
patients will take better care of themselves. Not an easy task at all. I've been doing this for 30 years. I found very few digital interventions that actually accomplish that. It's very difficult to do. Uh, but then you also have things like electronic health records, certainly data privacy that is incumbent within electronic health records. You have patient monitoring, you have medication compliance adherence tools. There are all types of voice skills with Siri and Google and Alexa now, where people are interacting with their healthcare data using voice applications. So that is digital health. And ultimately in an equation, you'd look at it from data that's anything that's turned into data, whether it's from the human body or around the human body, including things like websites, et cetera. So those sorts of points are critical because ultimately they create not just digital humans, but digital populations. And you can now have a, um, a, a, a very oriented uh, and very precise response to uh, anyone with heart disease, diabetes, cancer, you can personalize care today. It's, it's an extraordinarily different ecosystem for healthcare than it was even five years ago. And uh, Shirley, a uh, great question. We will talk about absolutely the physician practice and what it means now to have digital technologies enabled within your, within your practice and how that will not only help you work smarter and, and not have to work as hard. So really this idea of working smarter, not harder, is enabled uh, through the digital health revolution that we're seeing today. And uh, we'll go into that in a little bit, but great question, Shirley, thank you for that. And again, anyone else that wants to ask a question, certainly um, you know, dial it up in the chat box here today, or uh, just connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, Again, as Dr. Lazar will tell you, I'm generally online and responsive on email and LinkedIn. Uh, so it's uh, the benefit of having uh, children that are in their 20s. So I'm no longer in the child rearing years. It's also the benefit of really, really having a passion for what I'm doing and being able to attack things like uh, health equity, not just in the US, but around the world through the stuff that I do every day. But anyway, let's talk about the 12 vectors of digital healthcare, And that's important because a lot of folks have a hard time understanding the definition of digital and then if they can begin to pick that up, they have a hard time understanding how it's manifested in our healthcare ecosystem on a daily basis. And so uh, it really is expansive and it really is a, a critical component to think when we start thinking about healthcare e-commerce, when people are buying their drugs online, now getting them delivered by Amazon through PillPack, whether they're thinking about wearables and biosensors, the Apple Watch is one of the most diffusive technologies in medicine today. Uh, not nearly as diffusive as like a, a stethoscope or certainly a scale, but when you start talking about electronic technologies, uh, the Apple Watch is extraordinary, not only in terms of what it's done in the last roughly 10 years, but what it is going to do over the next 10 years, really becoming a, not just a, a watch or a place you can get sports scores or stock prices or the latest med, med, medical news from Medscape and things like that. But you can also, you will also be able to start to understand, understand if you're going into uh, neighborhoods that have had either flooding issues, environmental issues, crime issues, you can start to understand if your heart rate is uh, above what it should be, uh, if your uh, sleep is abnormal. There are a number of things that Apple's planning on doing over the next five years that will become almost a necessity, almost be, uh, ridiculous to not have a wearable, whether it's Apple Watch or Fitbit or Axiom or one of these others. The next vector is really around this sector, this vector called uh, apps and health tools like that. Apps in general are extremely poorly adopted right now in our society. Uh, most people do not want to interact with any kind of a technology that reminds them that they're sick. So most apps today in healthcare require users to enter data. And people don't want to enter data. They, they want to uh, and remind themselves that they're sick. They want to have fun. They want to be normal. They want to feel like they felt like when they were 21. And so apps have a very low single digit adoption rate. There is not one healthcare app <clears throat> currently that's ranked in the, the top 500 apps in the world uh, scales and charts. So ultimately, that's a big deal with healthcare in general and specifically within the app vector. 
So apps are important. Analytics and big data as another vector in digital health are immensely important. Analytics and big data are where we're seeing creation in the ecosystem. Startups are scaling at a massive rate there. I should absolutely tell you that there have been unprecedented funding events happening in digital health over the last 18 months. We saw a company with roughly $100 million in revenue sell for $18.5 billion when Lavongo sold to Teladoc. Uh, again, that was an extraordinary, the biggest sale of a tech company in terms of a multiple outside of a tech company that sold to Facebook that had no revenue and sold for a few billion dollars. <clears throat> and digital health now has raised $12 billion in venture capital in the first six months of 2021, the largest venture capital sector in the world in the united states today so we're seeing a lot of fund flow and a lot of capital flow around digital health which is heightened the excitement around what's going on because generally when you see a lot of funding you see some pretty rapid development and rapid diffusion which is what really one of the things that i study the other components that we should really talk about when we talk about vectors are medical devices uh being a big one uh digital medical devices uh, are one of the one of the areas where we're seeing an immense amount of diffusion across society. So now we're moving into up, upper double digit diffusion rates for medical devices like ResMed and, and CPAPs and things of these sorts going home and being able to wear a, a chest strap for monitoring your AFib or your DFib. These sorts of tools and technologies were non-existent roughly 10 years ago. Today, most health plans roughly 730 out of the 750 health plans in America cover these sorts of devices. Most hospitals have that in their repertoire of being able to treat patients remotely and not have them come into hospitals. And especially during the pandemic, now we're seeing these sorts of medical, digital medical devices skyrocket. And so the FDA, what have they done during the epidemic? They've used the expedited use authorization tool as a mechanism to rapidly approve digital medical devices as well. And so we're seeing this kind of diffusion and this kind of rampant adoption of digital medical devices really escalate within the medical system. Again, a lot of these devices were in the, the single digits to the low double digits, and now they've massively increased into the mid to high double digits in a lot of cases. <clears throat> And um, uh, a great question coming in again from Shirley. Shirley, you're going to get the gold star today for the talk. Uh, we will definitely talk about uh, uh, equity and, and digital disparities and digital divides increasing over the course of the pandemic. I'm writing a paper on this right now. It is immensely important for everyone to understand. And I'm actually holding a conference on it. Uh, you're all invited for free. The Digital Health Posing with the United Nations and Google and the World Bank, a number of other multilateral organizations. But that'll be held on October 21st. And again, I'll, I can send uh, the information to Dr. Lazar to distribute to everybody. But absolutely an important topic. We'll talk about that more in a minute. As you've all seen, telemedicine has been uh, an incredible uh, and, and massive adoption rate has, in, has increased telemedicine to the point now where there's a consortium of companies called Virtual First. What does that mean? Virtual first means that employers, health plans are now aggregating to offer healthcare in a virtual first only method. They are saying effectively, if you want to go to the doctor first, you have to jump onto a telemedicine tool and see them virtually. And then once you go by that gate, then you can go to the bricks and mortar and do the stuff on site. Now, what does that mean for doctors? That means for doctors like you know heads of hospital systems, that is a potentially massively disruptive event that could, if it took off as a trend, if it does continue to diffuse into the ecosystem, because we're already seeing a number of test pilots happening this year with Kaiser and United Healthcare and a number of other systems in the Northwest with Puget Sound, where they are shunt they're shunting every patient into a telemedicine visit before they go to a, a clinic or a hospital, unless it's obviously an ER visit. But the idea that <clears throat> these bricks and mortar facilities would only see visits after a telemedicine visit would potentially have massive ramifications on inpatient volume, on uh, clinic volume, and other areas that are absolutely desperately needing those revenues 
And given the, the thin margins that these facilities and these clinics have already, <clears throat> any significant long-term disruption in those visits would have a potentially massive disruption in their overall long-term viability. So telemedicine is not just something that's here and now with this current endemic culture that we're in with this new normal, whether it's uh, temporary, who knows how long it lasts, but it is something that employers and health plans have seized upon as a potential massive cost disruption within the ecosystem, much like managed care was in the 90s. This virtual first movement could be this next massive disruption to physicians and hospitals in the 2020s. <clears throat> and so there was also, uh, I think, from the physician standpoint, and there was a question about the digital practice and digital technology for physician practices, going into this remote patient monitoring uh, technology that we're seeing in personalized medicine, uh, this is an area where uh, I have seen tremendous upside for clinics and for physicians who have studied the reimbursement systems and studied monitoring can actually be billed and optimized through billing so that financially physicians and clinics and hospitals can make upwards of 50 to 70% more per patient by using remote patient monitoring tools for Medicaid and Medicare patients. Again, this is a, a stunning development that really came through only because of the pandemic. But what we're seeing is that in, in places that have very strong reimbursement rates for Medicaid and Medicare, remote patient monitoring tools when used properly, and this is difficult, it goes back to the, the, the really the big disparities and, tech, and the socio-technical issues that we have with certain populations that are coming from low resource areas and, and have not had that history with technology, uh, the, the actual adoption of the technology at the home can be an issue. And you need those to optimize the reimbursement rates. <clears throat> but that is a massive opportunity uh, for, uh, for hospitals and for clinics to become digitized, if you will, and really help with the, and, and reduce, if you will, also some of those digital disparities. Dr. Berger, you, do you have your hand raised? Yeah, so <laughs> Stan, there was a question raised in the chat room specifically about the issue of disparities. Uh, do you wanna go into that a little more? Because one of my concerns in terms of running this hospital and dealing with our patient population is I'm very concerned that digital health movement will actually increase disparities because it takes a lot of capital up front to be able to do it on the one hand. And we're because we're so dependent on government payers, we don't have a lot of capital to be able to spend. And secondly, a lot of our patients don't even have broadband access. And we have found significant hesitancy in our patients willingness to do virtual video visits because uh, they don't want to show us where they live. Yeah, those are all absolutely uh, important issues to, to understand and to mitigate in various levels and various ways, shapes and forms. And, you know, again, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm affiliated with Columbia Medical Center. I've been there since 1996. <clears throat> and again, in Washington Heights, I've done uh, over a hundred different studies in digital health and, and biomedical informatics since 1996. And so really looking at some of these issues and looking at some of the social determinants of health within the Washington Heights area ha has been stunning to see just how some of these ideas, and I've also done uh, two, maybe a dozen different grants in India where the disparities are massive. It's impossible to even imagine living in the Western bubble that we live in in North America some of the, the very basic issues that were that we encounter these in doing any kind of digital health research with populations in either uh, New Delhi or some, some remote parts of India or even in Haiti. The idea here is that in the, in the United States, the, dis, the digital dis disparities have widened with the pandemic already. And like you're, like you're mentioning Dr. Berger, we're seeing the, the, the lack of technical infrastructure and we're seeing the lack of socio-technical uh, approaches and, and just the lack of socio-technical histories with these technologies. Uh, uh, and it could even be something as, as mundane as, you know, having a cell phone that's five years old and don't, no longer su is, can support an app 
for a certain digital technology, for a certain remote patient monitoring technology to lock into, to tie to, and then upload data to. So the digital disparities are, uh, are, are immense and uh, it, it, they have widened tremendously. Things like uh, how to find a testing set, things like getting tests downloaded to an iPhone or a Samsung or a Pixel. Uh, but in this country, the digital disparities are minute compared to what we look at as digital disparities between populations in the US and then populations in the uh, lowest resourced 1 billion people. So really the poorest 100 countries in the world. And we look at the digital disparities there and they vastly widened, not just on the biomedical informatics side with things like telemedicine and remote patient monitoring, but on the bioinformatics side. So being able to sequence a, a specific uh, saliva test and deliver it to an iPhone or deliver it to a droid or whatever it might be. I, I, the, the countries that we do research in globally in that, that lowest resourced 1 billion are, the, the gap has widened so much over the last two years because of the pandemic. It is stunning. And there are people at the World Bank, there are people at the WHO whose full-time job it is to try to find ways uh, to reduce those disparities, as well as USAID, one of the one of the world's biggest bilateral agencies, USAID in uh, in DC is working with 23 different free market democracies on a regular basis in health IT, like large grants to help countries digitize their electronic health record system, add more digital uh, interventions, uh, like Motec, a, a project I worked on uh, six eight years ago now in Africa. And so there are mechanisms trying to reduce the disparities, but everything has accelerated during the pandemic. We've, there's been the, the acceleration of digital disparities because of the, the simple wealth effect. There's also been a really embarrassing side effect of this neo-nationalism that we're seeing take hold globally. And it's now taken hold, not just in the US, but in India and a lot of other countries where medical technology, whether it's molecules or uh, devices uh, are being held into those countries to make sure that those are going to be able to get those devices and those molecules, those vaccines, whatever it might be, first, because the, the effectively it's, you know, we've got nations feel like they need to take care of their own before they start distributing these sorts of medical technologies. And again, medical technologies are defined as hardware, software, uh, certainly uh, pills and biologics. So it has four different uh, manifestations technology does in medicine. So that's an important thing to realize as well. But this conversation around digital disparities is massive. And again, if anyone wants to drop a chat room or connect on LinkedIn, would love to continue it. But and uh, certainly if there's other angles around the disparity question, uh, that's absolutely key. And David Kaufman saying there's also substantial institutional inequities with hospitals and medical centers lacking resources to execute on digital health platforms, absolutely. And, and David, we saw this at the beginning of the pandemic in the United States last March, April, May. There were institutions across the Midwest, even here in New York City, that had no telemedicine really set up whatsoever. And so it was not a run, but it was a sprint to get telemedicine installed, try to find ways to take care of patients remotely with remote patient monitoring. And what we saw was the wealthier hospitals that had telemedicine set up five years ago and we're already institutionalizing it could just flip a switch and they could instantaneously start seeing revenues come in from telemedicine. And there was another interesting focus and this is also a part of the disparity of the hospitals. The wealthier hospitals had the funds to negotiate capitated arrangements with managed care organizations. So they could delegate claims, they could delegate uh, medical management and most importantly, they could delegate, delegate payments. So Hospitals that had the funding in 1995, 2000, 2005, 2010 to move toward a capitated arrangement with their managed care companies, they all got their checks from managed care companies on the 1st of January. And so they had already received, or the 1st of February, the first, they'd already been contracted to take, make and to, to accept 100 million, 500 million for 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 Medicare, Medicaid patients or whatever it might be. So those hospitals did very well in the pandemic because they had very, very little volume. So the utilization was down here, but the funding was up here and the funding was all pre-negotiated on contract. So there's a number of economics that went into the play of how the hospitals that just had not been funded well, had not had the funding to begin with, 
did even worse and the pandemic accelerated a lot of these underlying disparities. So um, really, really good. And surely again, absolutely, internet access was an enormous issue for, and it still is today. And people are, you have a number of people trying to put satellites in the sky. So the internet access will be at least at a, um, you know, a half a gig or something. So people do the way, but there are a number of things, a number of uh, processes, a number of um, programs in place trying to reduce this issue of digital health disparities. And again, uh, terrific questions around that. Again, please do continue with the, the questions and the conversation. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, some more examples around digital health technologies before we start going into some of the broader techniques and publications that are occurring, that have occurred, that have really shaped what's happening in digital health today. <clears throat> if you take a look at the upper left-hand side, you'll see one of the newest digital health technology, wearable technologies called Halo from Amazon. And Amazon, if you don't know this, you should get to know this very quickly, but two of the bigger retail institutions in America are going absolutely headfirst into healthcare and they're using digital as the mechanism to do that. Amazon and Amazon Care and PillPack and a number of other mechanisms across the ecosystem that Amazon and telemedicine have been very quietly developing, including Halo, which is effectively connecting your, your, your wristwatch and your, your activity data, even Amazon's developed sleep tools that sit next to your bed. These sorts of remote patient monitoring and, self -mon and patient self-monitoring tools that can then be uploaded to the Amazon electronic health record that can then be utilized by the Amazon telemedicine platform are all part of Amazon's very, very detailed supply chain strategy going from being able to deliver your medicines, get your labs done at your home, at your office, being able to go to a facility of Amazon's choice for getting your scan at a heavy discount. And then eventually they're recruiting a series of doctors and networks into the Amazon care model. And so Walmart, obviously they can't sit there and do nothing. Walmart is already on top of this. They've been putting clinics in their 3,000 plus stores around the country. Walmart has a very heavy digital platform. If you've never used it, just please do go to walmart.com and log into their personal health record for their, their patient health record for patients around the country. But Walmart is very, very aggressively moving into healthcare as well now. And uh, they bought uh, an e-health and really a, an electronic commerce company called jet.com, literally sitting here in Jersey City. Uh, in the Northeast. So effectively Walmart's electronic hub is just across the river uh, in the harbor really from Brooklyn. And so the, the idea that uh, these devices, whether it's a Samsung Galaxy watch, which you can see on the left-hand side, or if you take down below, you see the Apple watch or over the right-hand side, you see the Google Fit bit, which is something that Google is now uh, slowly trying to figure out how to incorporate everything that they're doing with their life science company called Verily to their Google health company, which they've recently restructured. Uh, and they're really trying to how to even compete right now in healthcare, given how fast everyone else is moving in the area. And then as you go back up the right-hand side, you see ResMed, which we talked about earlier. ResMed is one of the leading digital health interventions on the device side with literally millions of patients having this kind of uh, sleep uh, device sitting next to their bed, measuring their sleep quality, uh, helping them with, uh, um, getting oxygen, you know, sleeping at night with the CPAPs machine, et cetera. So uh, again, competing with Philips, et cetera. One device and one company you should definitely note, again, it's a New York City-based company called OneDrop. It's a digital health company. They have uh, a glucometer. They have strips. It's the shaving club for men, for, for diabetics. Effectively, you pay a, an annual fee of, I think, 119 a year. You get a glucometer you get unlimited test strips and you get this gorgeous app. It is by far the best app that we've ever seen in our research. Uh, it is uh, made by someone, Jeff Dotchis, who was the co-founder of Razorfish in the 1990s, which was a dot-com creation company. They basically made websites for hundreds of millions of dollars, went public. He made a lot of money, uh, high nine figures. And uh, that then crashed in 2000 with the dot-com crash. He started up a few other companies. He was diagnosed as a type one diabetic at age 46 uh, in 2016. He got a consult from a physician 
uh, it lasted about two or three minutes. The physician said, here's some pamphlets, read them, go home, call me in three months. And Jeff walked out of there furious, determined to reinvent diabetes, and that's one drop. And so now from his office on Houston Street, Jeff has developed the most beautiful app you've ever seen with a, an absolute James Bond-like glucometer that patients love. And it's one of the fastest growing diabetes companies in the world. Uh, and then when you think about digital, you also think about medication and this company called Medic, which I would encourage you to look up on LinkedIn as well and, and add and follow. This is the most advanced medication supply chain company based out of Ottawa. They've been around for 20 years. We've been studying them since 2004, uh, but they have a, an RFID enabled and Bluetooth enabled uh, pill bottle, as well as a medication packet where uh, you can actually uh, check to see when your patients are interacting with their medication. So if a patient is on any kind of a medication that has any sensitivity around the frequency and the timing of the dose, you can be notified if they, for instance, for a week, they don't touch the medication. So you're not getting medi medication alerts every hour. You're getting them only when they matter, which is if the patient's really not touching the medication at all. So these sorts of technologies are changing the way medication is being delivered today. They're making patients more aware of their own biofeedback loops and their patients in a very personalized and a very targeted way. And it's something that is uh, straight on uh, out of uh, Hollywood. When you think about some of the opportunities that this is giving us uh, in terms of these devices. Um, and certainly, uh, if there are any other questions around this, uh, don't be afraid, don't hesitate to ask and continue, keep up the conversation. Great conversation going on in the chat box. Uh, love that as well. Um, along the lines of why this is important. So let's talk a little bit about why the digital revolution is really scary for anyone in healthcare right now. Uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember, Blockbuster used to be one of America's most successful companies. It was a video renting when video was on what was called VHS tapes. Uh, it was uh, the darling of Wall Street. Uh, it was bought and sold by different uh, hedge funds and private equity groups for billions of dollars. They had 10,000 stores across America for renting and then returning your VHS tapes and you can watch your home movies at night. So Blockbuster was uh, absolutely successful. Then this company called Netflix came along and Netflix was originally just DVD rental by mail. And it was interesting. Netflix actually had a patent on renting by subscription. And it was maybe a 10 page patent. It wasn't that uh, fearful in 1997 when they were granted the patent by the uh, USPTO. Uh, but then people started renting DVDs by mail and they didn't have late fees. It was five bucks a month subscription. It saves you a lot of money as opposed to paying 10 bucks a day late fees to Blockbuster. So all of a sudden, Blockbuster saw their revenues coming down. Netflix saw their revenues going up. And again, that was, Netflix had no internet connectivity for watching videos online at that point. So this is the late 90s, early 2000s. Netflix stock was like three bucks a share. And that little by little, it started chipping away at Blockbuster and Walmart. Walmart also rented videos. So then Blockbuster and Walmart in 2003, they started their own online rental by subscription business for videos and DVDs. And guess what happened? Netflix, Netflix sued Blockbuster and Walmart for patent infringement because they patented rental by subscription. So effectively, uh, at the end of the day, Blockbuster went out of business and Walmart had to shut down their rental by subscription business by order of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court got the case finally, went up through federal, et cetera, and eventually went to the Supreme Court and they sided with Netflix. It was a pretty clear patent violation case. And ultimately, Netflix went on to be the extraordinarily successful company over the next uh, 20 years and Blockbuster went out of business. Pharmaceutical companies, health plans, none of these institutions that hire and employ tens of thousands of people all over the country want to go out of business. They are fighting for their sustainability. Uh, when you look at digital therapeutics and you look at a device that can cure pain by putting a goggle over your eyes and listening to uh, some whooshing sounds and, and seeing light in your eyes, 
that is on the way to being approved by the FDA right now. That has much higher efficacy rates than most pain meds and minus most of the side effects. These sorts of digital therapeutics are coming along for depression, for anxiety, for a lot of the mental health effects that we're seeing, especially rise during the pandemic. So neurological symptoms and neurological conditions are going to be heavily disrupted by digital health. And we're talking about cancer. The Merck drug Keytruda was the first drug in history to come with a genetic test. And it blew away a lookalike drug for cancer that BMS had developed a year and a half earlier because BMS did not have a genetic test for the biologic before being administered to a patient. So ultimately, Merck's drug Keytruda ended up adding one and a half to $2 billion in revenue a year on its bottom line. Uh, BMS ended up having to almost like shelf the drug. The drug is almost not used at all. So the genetic testing, the digital analog for a cancer drug ended up becoming a massive disruptor for BMS. And so now most drugs, whenever they can, they're trying to add that genetic type and put this together and make sure that if they have the opportunity, there is a digital analog that they're going to bring to market with their molecule. Hospitals and health plans are in the same boat. The, the digital strategy is now one of the cornerstones of their organizational strategy. They have to have digital, whether it's about labs, whether it's about scripts, whether it's about radiology or, or scans, or whether it's about simple electronic medical records. So <clears throat> this idea of being disrupted and having revenue lines disrupted because of not optimizing the digital strategy, whether it's optimizing remote patient monitoring so the billings can be maximized and optimized, or whether it's having the best telemedicine tool to not burn out doctors because the telemedicine tool that <clears throat> the hospital ended up purchasing was not the one with the best user interface, user experience. And so these are the sorts of technologies and these are the sorts of disruptions that every executive around today is thinking about. And that's why we can, for the first time in digital health and really medical history, really talk about this being a point where we're now talking about a singular point of 12 months where medicine went from being largely analog to being largely digital. And this has never happened before, even during the dot-com boom and the dot-com revolution, most physicians during the dot-com revolution were using websites for real basic information gathering and maybe checking their stock prices. They were not really dialing up the, the dot-com boom and then websites for doing serious patient uh, interactions, communications, or treatments. So uh, we are in the midst of a digital health revolution and thus the, the topic today. Would love to have uh, more questions and uh, and talk more with this very, very incredible audience. You, you're, you guys have been uh, an amazing audience and uh, they're just incredible questions coming over every minute or two. So absolutely loving it uh, from Doug and Shirley uh, and Alan and everyone else. So uh, uh, keeping, uh, keep on asking away. So I'm gonna ask a question, Stan, and that was a great talk and a great overview. And thank you for kicking off our digital health interest group seminar series. Uh, there is so much going on in digital health right now. And, and that is obvious by the amount of private equity and venture capital being poured into this. So if you're a hospital or you're a health system, how do you weed out the good from the bad? That, that's not easy to do. And you know, I think there's, um, there's an economist uh, named Frank Lichtenberg. He's a, a colleague of mine at Columbia Business School. He's been a professor for 30 years. And uh, he's done uh, an amazing amount of research on the medical economics of digital health. And one of the things that he's found is that you really need to find a technology that has a return on investment of roughly 10 to 15 times the current inline intervention. And so it's, and that's not easy to prove over a long period of time because you, as you all know, when you first use a phone or a piece of software or any kind of a digital technology, there's usually about a one to three month learning curve before you're really using it fluently. 
not not at all unlike digital health technologies. And so whether it's your electronic health record, whether it's a new algorithm, whether it's a new analytics tool, or whether it's some sort of new device, there is a learning curve there. So trying to pilot these technologies and understand them in a small population of physicians, like three, four people, that's really critical. And what I would say is test and learn. That's what my career has been on doing over 675 studies, testing these emerging technologies to see if they're efficacious. One, are they efficacious economically? Three, are they efficacious? Do they offer any efficacy at all experientially? So if your doctors, nurses, uh, PTs are going online and using this stuff or using these devices and they can't use them, they're too difficult to use, the experiential score is zero. So just get rid of it. Four, are they efficacious clinically? That's gotta be really the number one score that you've gotta look at the clinical efficacy for these technologies and are they actually offering an improvement or is it just a lot of hot air? And then number five, and this is probably the least understood and the most precarious to navigate is the integrational. And I'm making that word up. I've made that word up for years now, but ultimately the integrational capability of the technology. What does that mean? How is that measured? It means that the technology has got to be integrated into the institution with as little friction as possible. And it mean it can be measured by the ability for a physician or department chair or department head to be able to integrate and use it, utilize that technology in less than 10 hours of department staff time. If it takes your MIS department 150 hours to deploy technology, I can tell you right now, I'm just gonna have, well, it's gonna be a whole bunch of trouble for folks because you've already got a staff that's completely overworked. You've already got a staff that's completely on the edge with the pandemic for now almost two years. And to bring in a technology, it's going to cost another five hours a week of their time to deploy and then another five hours a week to maintain for the next three years. People, clinicians, staff, they can't handle that right now. So the integrational capacity has to be and the integrational score has to be very, very high for these sorts of technologies to be adopted. And that's my short answer. You should hear my long answer. <laughs> I'll add one to that is that the person who's doing the actions within whatever solution you have, the solution can't be causing them more work. And we could talk about that another time, but that is critical. If the person who you're requiring to do the action gets more work because of that action, it's never going to be implemented. So that's exactly problem. right. Not for sure. So happy to take questions at this time. Jason, any questions that you had or comments? Uh, just uh, an incredible talk that I think covered a, a whole range of topics and uh, really an outstanding kickoff talk for, uh, you know, what David really had a, a vision here, and that is to accelerate digital health care in, in downstate. Um, my question is, you know, Stan and I have had many conversations, and I, I think he understands the downstate landscape pretty well. Uh, and I think the chat had some comments about uh, disparities in, in, in health care. Uh, we talk frequently about, you know, some of the obstacles in terms of instituting um, telemedicine. Stan, where do you see an institution like Downstate going in terms of uh, digital health? Tell us what we should be doing, I guess. Yeah, no, and, and again, I think there's a lot of questions coming through the chat room about other things around like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and uh, certainly outcomes and population health outcomes. And you know, these are all really fundamental questions and, and, and really issues for a system like Downstate, which is really the center of excellence of medicine uh, for, for so many people. And so the, the ability to identify, to engage, test, learn, and then potentially contract with these technologies in a way that's going to uh, inter inter be interoperable with other folks and other technologies already on site, legacy systems, uh, again, as uh, we've seen in the chat room, you know, the ability for the, the new systems to work with the old is critical. Inter interoperability is 
fundamental, especially when we go back to that friction of integration. So, you know, I think it, uh, most importantly, it's, it's patient outcomes. That's the number one thing. What will make patient outcomes go up? What will help, you know, again, uh, to heal is the highest calling. Uh, as we know, that's written on the, the outside of the, the Columbia uh, Medical Center. And so this idea of digital technologies helping everybody across all different economic divides uh, and reducing these disparities now that we've seen them expand and widen over the first half of the pandemic. Now let's try to find ways to reduce them. So that's, and there's a lot of grant money out there to do that. There are a lot of grants, especially in, for a hospital like Downstate where, you know, there's a lot of vulnerable communities that Downstate supporting and, and really providing support too. So uh, having that mix uh, is really an, is an important component to remember when building the digital health strategy for Downstate and, and optimizing the revenues. So after clinical outcomes and improving population health and patient care, it's the economic viability. If there is no economically viable downstate, then there is a zero quality factor. Patients get zero care. So protecting the economic interests and making sure that billings can be optimized, that we can make sure that Medicaid, Medicare, corporate, and, and, not, and a lot of donors are going to participate in this and find ways to support downstate as it expands its digital footprint in medicine. That is also a really important thing to look at. And there are a lot of systems today that have been built around being able to provide uh, new economic uh, years ago before the pandemic. So there's a number of things to, to discuss there, but that's certainly a, a smattering of them right there. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the funding available because I know our Dean of Research, <clears throat> David Christini is on the talk and I, I, he was very excited uh, to hear that you were going to be speaking. I'm sure he's starting to spin his wheels and think about how we can capture some of those uh, funding dollars. Uh, other questions from uh, people in the audience. There was a question about AI. That's a big talk all to itself, Stan, but- It is, I and I think it, <clears throat> and it's appropriate when we're talking about digital disparity and digital divide, because one of the things I'm working on with the World Bank is trying to reduce the digital disparities being caused by AI. AI is really being the, and the machine learning algorithms that are being built today are being built for people from wealthier, predominantly Caucasian nations. And when we start thinking about where we really need that AI to optimize and provide efficient healthcare, it's again, going back to the, the lowest income to the lowest resource to 1 billion, 2 billion people, which are not including people who are of Caucasian descent, et cetera. So we've got to find a way to make sure that computer scientists that are building these algorithms are building them in a way that there, it, it, we have diverse studies, we have diverse populations where the AI and the machine learning tools are being developed. And we've got to make sure there's funding there because ultimately it's, it's a, in a free market capitalist society. These algorithms are being built and they're being funded by the people who are going to pay for them. And in the traditional model of medical technology diffusion, and we heard about it from Bezos when he stepped off his rocket, he said, we are trying to build space travel with the wealthier first leading the way until we build economies of scale for everyone to go to space. Well, in medical technology, that's no different. Why do we think that we actually have eradicated smallpox, the first and only disease on the planet to be eradicated? It was because there was a cure, there was a cure, there's a vaccine and inoculation found in 1804. And eventually by 1979, there were enough wealthy nations that realized that we really had a chance to wipe out smallpox as a virus if we just poured billions of dollars into five countries, Ethiopia, India, uh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, the last five countries where smallpox was endemic until the WHO certified smallpox eradicated in 1979. With AI, it's not going to work that way. AI, if we build these algorithms with predominantly wealthy Caucasian data, we're not going to have a good working algorithm for people living in Haiti or living in Ghana or living in India. So we've got to rethink the medical fusion system now. We can't wait 10 years. It's going to be too late. And we will have developed a lot of good algorithms, none of which are going to be helpful for people living in these poor countries. 
Other questions or comments? We've got um, another one that came around, around being able to evaluate health applications consistently um, in terms of who, what, how effective. And that's the other thing too. And, and the, 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 the work that I do in my lab is now for the last 30 years really uh, has been focused on being able to do very cheap, very quick studies, not, you know, 100,000, 200,000, a million dollar study, but like five and $10,000 studies uh, and being able to do them rapidly, you know, not, not six months, not 12 months, but being able to understand the technology and gating the technology with a start with the economics, then go to the experiential, then go to the clinical. So there's a way to assess these emerging technologies to determine whether or not there is a there there. And so a big part of the digital health journey for the institution and even for the individual is to find ways to quickly process and quickly identify and test uh, with one or two people whether or not that new Apple Watch or whether or not the new Halo or the new Axiom is actually user-friendly or if the new EHR is user-friendly, et cetera. And so these ways of identifying and these methods of almost like mini kind of rapid user experience tests, uh, these are really good ways to being able to identify whether or not these emerging technologies are even interesting to uh, engage before any large, large amount of engagement or institutional energy is given to these technologies. Uh, that's important. And it's also important when doing these evaluations to remember that the entrepreneurs, the inventors of these technologies generally have, and there was a study recently done on this, uh, they have very, very <laughs> oper they're very optimistic. So these, these engineers, these inventors, these entrepreneurs, the optimism around their technologies is generally, uh, let's just say like extraordinary. I'm not talking about Elizabeth Holmes extraordinary. I'm talking about like below that, but above normal. So it's important. It's really incumbent upon the physician scientist and the physician digital health scientist to utilize a systematic and structured evaluation to make sure that the optimism of the inventor, the optimism of the entrepreneur uh, does not become infectious, if you will, <laughs> with the uh, physician and their staff, because it can be dangerous if, if we don't have a lot of funding to do too much of this kind of adoption. Stan, one last question. Uh, the issue about data security. Uh, someone has asked specifically, could you speak to that issue? Absolutely. And without a doubt, I think it's, it's actually scaring the bejesus out of me right now because everyone's looking at pipelines being hacked. They're looking at meat plants being hacked. No one's talking about, and by foreign countries in a lot of ways. And uh, but they're not talking about things like um, uh, clinical trials or, uh, or patient uh, genomic sequences. And um, we do know, uh, and again, I read way too much of this stuff. I'm not trying to scare you guys, but we do know that there are certain foreign hostile nations who are in fact collecting as much data as they can about uh, literally every single American there is. And so... Uh, the need to protect <clears throat> uh, our patient data, I, I think, and I've been saying this for years, is a national security emergency. And right now, uh, the government's not giving enough funding to hospitals and to clinics to ensure that this type of uh, data is protected. And uh, there, there should be, and uh, we should have our own uh, healthcare cybersecurity bill with uh, uh, half a trillion dollars for hospitals to modernize their cybersecurity across the board, because it's not just a technical issue. A lot of it is a human factors issue uh, where we have, again, without any malice, people just forget to do stuff, whether it's uh, you know certain security protocols, shutting down computers, uh, whatever it might be. And so ultimately we, we have to really invest in this. This is an enormous, uh, issue cybersecurity is absolutely top three issues uh, for our nation, not just our healthcare system to, to address. Jason, do you want to close? Uh, sure. Um, once again, uh, Stan, it's been a pleasure. Uh, welcome to Downstate. 
Uh, I think uh, from the many great comments in the chat, you've engaged, uh, you know, a lot of interest. I think it's the, the perfect uh, keynote address, if you will. Uh, I've heard bits and pieces of your comments before, and yet every time you, you uh, speak, I learn something uh, new. I think you've given us a, a broad overview as to the different domains of digital health, uh, where we are and, and where we're going. I think each and every one of us has been inspired and each and every one of us uh, will um, you know, think about your talk long after uh, it has completed. So once again, on behalf of Dr. Berger, uh, Dean Brunicardi wanted me to send his regards and, uh, and uh, everybody else, uh, I just want to thank you for uh, taking the time and spending uh, the last hour with us. Um, I want to thank everybody else for coming. I certainly want to thank David uh, Berger for, uh, you know, starting what many of us had thought to do previously, and that was to uh, start this uh, digital interest group, which, uh, uh, you know, will certainly build on a collective intellect. So, um, thank you very much, and uh, I wish everybody a good night. Yep. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you all. It's been an honor. Thank you, Dr. Berger. <laughs>